You're listening to Online Pet Health Podcasts with Dr. Megan Kelly, continuing education for veterinarian rehabilitation therapists. Learn more at OnlinePetHealth.com. Hey Vet Rehabbers, today's podcast is a revisit of one of our Facebook Lives in the Small Animal Vet Rehabbers group. In addition to that group, we also have the Hydro Vet Rehabbers, Equine Vet Rehabbers and our Business Vet Rehabbers group. There are amazing communities online of Vet Rehabbers from all over the world, so supportive and they share tips and advice on how they practice Vet Rehab. So please come and hang out with us on Facebook. Now, Nay's dog, Sasha, has hip dysplasia, and so she was on the search to find out as much information and research about the condition. And this actually led her to write a blog, which we'll put the link in the description. It's what you need to know to connect the missing links of hip dysplasia. Now, this is a topic which we cover really heavily in the online Pet Health Members Portal, and we have at least seven webinars on this topic. So it's basically nearly the end of the year and I thought I would just take this opportunity to wish you guys all happy holidays. I I know for a lot of you, 2020 hasn't been the greatest year, but we are so close now to 2021 and wishing you all a very, very happy new year and all the best for 2021. So without further ado, over to Anae. Hey, Big Rehabbers. How are you guys doing? Anae, thank you so much for joining me. Oh, thanks for having me, Meg. So, guys, we're going to be chatting today about hip dysplasia. And um, Anae's dog, Sasha, um, has got hip dysplasia. And interestingly, I also have a dog called Sunshine who has hip dysplasia. So we come from personal experience about hip dysplasia. And because of this, Anae has been doing a lot of research into hip dysplasia. So we thought it would be a good idea for us to chat about the research and everything that she's found and then also look at um, the journey of the pet owner because she's wearing two hats now. She's the pet owner and the therapist. Um, and just to see sort of where our pet owners that have their own dogs that have hip dysplasia, where they are and where their mindsets are. So thanks guys for joining us. If you are listening to us, give us a little thumbs up so we know that you can hear us and let us know from where in the world you are. Um, and hey, thanks so much for joining me. Oh, thanks Meg. I'm really excited to be talking about hip dysplasia because I think that it's something where we could be doing one. It's something we have fantastic results in, right? Like the moment we start seeing these patients, it doesn't matter what age they are or where they are in their, in their journey, we have really good results. Um, but it's also something that's lifelong. It's progressive. It's degenerative. Um, so it can be really hectic for an owner. And I know that I'm not the only hip dysplasia owner in this group, (laughs) I'm 100% sure. Um, But I'd love to tell you guys about Sasha and about our journey. So Sasha's a boy and I got him as a puppy. Um, He's a German Shepherd. I got him as a puppy while I was a student um, studying veterinary physiotherapy in Plet. Um, So we we lived by the beach. We had dams and lakes everywhere. um, And it was like a fantastic place for him to grow up because Um, from day one I could incorporate swimming and walking in the forest and really good kind of exercise routines for him um, to set him up for success in the long term Um, and then as the years went by we obviously graduated and moved up to the city and didn't have those facilities anymore Um, and yeah lost the ability to do hydrotherapy regularly and being a working um person i also lost a lot of time with my own dog and i think that a lot of people will be able to relate to that as well um we have time to treat everyone else's patients everyone else's pets but we don't have time for our own broken babies um so he kind of pulled second string there for for about two years and then i had a baby and then he pulled like fifth string and was right at the bottom of my priority list um so no swimming um, and very little targeted exercise. And he just kind of had to get on with, with, with his life. Um, And yeah, I mean, I I can see the effect of that. um, You know, the changes that have happened over the years Um, in in the last couple of months, he's hit kind of flare up after flare up. It, It is winter now. So we do expect that, but he hasn't been bouncing back from them, regardless of the fact that I'm spending a lot of time treating him and working with him. Um, he's just not 
bouncing back. And now we're on crazy pain meds um, and all kinds of other, you know, things to try and help him. And um, yeah, it's not it's not really sustainable, right? So I've been doing some research in our in our membership portal because we have so many resources on this condition, um, and it's really just opened my eyes again to all the options that we have, um, all the things that we can and should be doing. And yeah, I'd love to just chat chat to you guys about it and share share that with you guys. Um, I'd love to know who else has hip dysplasia dogs that are their own dogs. Um, if you guys can just share that, I'd love that. Yeah, and if you guys do have your own dogs that are suffering from hip dysplasia and there are things that you're doing that are working, um, or not working, just share with us. So, like, this is really a discussion. We want to hear from you guys. So, if you are live now, you can write, if you're listening as a recording, we're going to come back and have a look. And it's really about sharing all the things that we are doing with our patients or with our own dogs um, that is working um, in hip dysplasia. So, and then we obviously you mentioned about all the amazing lectures that we have. And mm. um, hip dysplasia is a topic that we've got so much information. Um, so what are the what is the key things that you've learned um, looking back into all that content? Um, I think we can maybe start with David Dykus because he did two amazing lectures, didn't he? Yeah, yeah. So um, David Dykus did uh, part one and part two on hip dysplasia where he focused first on the young dog and then on the old dog. And really we're looking at these, like there's a very big difference if you're looking at a, a hip dysplasia as a puppy and if you're looking at it as a mature dog because um, as a young dog, you're really treating hip laxity um, and trying to strengthen that dog. So your goals are, are, are different. Your approach is going to be different because um, your core problem is that there isn't hip stability, that the hip is lax. Um, and with every stride, there's like a, a reduction in the subluxation of that hip. Um, and over time, that causes degeneration. And then when the dogs mature, you're really treating arthritis and no longer, you know, the, the incongruency of the hip. Um, although that does still, that is still um, present and over time becomes more of a problem again um, as the arthritis worsens. Um, so it's really like, for me, the, the takeaways from those two lectures is the different approach you're going to take at different phases of the, of the disease and then really highlighting a multimodal approach like you can't just throw one thing at this and then expect it's going to have an effect um and you have to be like the dog needs to be managed for their whole lives it's not going to go away um unless you surgically do something to improve it um or to take the problem away so um to me that was kind of the take home from from david's lectures is that you have to have a multimodal approach um and you need to focus you know your your goals your approach um to the phase of the of the disease in the dog yeah so you know sasha that name just reminded me of a case that i had called sasha as well it's actually a labrador um, yeah. and if i look back um to the cases that i've treated you know here in south africa and i think it's changing a little bit so I think people are a lot more open to conservative treatments and, and to rehabilitation now in hip dysplasia cases. When I say people, I mean the vets. They're more open to it. But, um, you know, a few years ago when a dog had hip dysplasia and it was maybe eight months old, the first thing they would have to would be surgery straight yeah. away. So conservative management really wasn't something that vets were, were thinking about. And um, I'd actually had a radio interview, and this lady, the owner, had heard me and um so she just contacted me to basically have some rehab some prehab basically because she had gone to a specialist and had decided on a total hip replacement and was now waiting now to for her dog to be old enough to have that done and so she thought let me do something and the dog was about six or seven months old so very young and this dog couldn't even stand it was so sore so um, you know, we talk about in those early days where they have laxity, and that's actually the main problem. But in the very, there is a section of that time, you know, where they actually are a little bit painful. Um, yeah. And then what happens is that that head of the femur becomes a little bit ivory-like, they're little cracks and fissures, and then eventually that becomes ivory-like, and then that pain sort of goes away, and laxity is their main problem. And they've got to get through that. And I think what happens is they present to vets in that, stage where they're a little bit painful and then the vet wants to jump into surgery 
anyway, Sasha had basically, the, the surgeon had said that Sasha would need a, a total hip replacement on both sides eventually. And um, it, this was all planned and she decided on this. And I, I started treating this dog using acupuncture. It was on anti-inflammatories twice a day, this dog at like six, seven months of age. After one month, we got it off the, the anti-inflammatories and Sasha never actually had a total hip replacement, but they, the owner is extremely diligent. So when I say yeah. that, she, she has carried on since Sasha's now like 12, 13 years of age. Mm -hmm. And she has gone for underwater treadmill every single week. She does acupuncture. She does therapeutic exercise. So she's really, really good. So those ones that sometimes we wanna, the vets want to jump ahead and have surgery can still be conservative managed. Mm -hmm. But it depends on the owner. And like when, you know, you yeah. speak now about you and about what you've gone through in your life. And I've got sunshine. And, you know, as you're talking, I feel like so guilty at times because I've also had that. I, I, and since coronavirus, actually, I've been around her so much more, you know, and I'm actually seeing, oh, my gosh, this is actually not OK, the way that she's moving and the way that she's getting up. And I've really got back into treating her now on a regular basis, and, you know, and she's having acupuncture every week or every two weeks. Um, but we've got to be mindful that there are owners, like we know what we should be doing, right? Um, and we're still not doing it. So that conservative approach is a lot of work for the owner as well. Um, and we've got to be thinking about that and what is actually, what is the right suggestions? And it, it would probably be different for different owners, right? Yeah. Yeah, I think so definitely, Meg. And, and I mean, if you think about kind of, the different life phases that we go through as people um there's a big difference between kind of your young years where you're unstable right every, every couple of years something changes um you move you get a new job you get married you have kids it's very hard to keep up a super consistent um program or protocol with your with your dog if that's how your life is like just you may not have access to hydrotherapy. You may not have access to a rehabilitation therapist. You just, like those things might not be options anymore at, at specific times in your life. And um, I mean, we can't feel guilty about that. That's what life is. That's what it does. That's how it works. Um, versus someone whose kids are grown, they're out of the house, or they never had kids. Um, they're stable in their job in their environment in their home um like they can they can set up their life so that they can manage their dog over years they can build those relationships with a rehab therapist in their area and just kind of get into a routine and continue with it over the next 10 years because they're going to be there for the next 10 years um so i think that's something as well to consider when we're when we're chatting to our owners when we're um assessing kind of what advice we want to give them uh that's going to be the best thing for their for their dog yeah yeah so now obviously with you and Sasha now you obviously she you you've got to a point now where nothing you're doing was actually working right mm -hmm. um, and and then you were considering going down the surgical route yes so i yeah. had him at a, in for an assessment with a a, a specialist um and I recently came into a bit of money. So I was like, I'm doing total hip replacements because this problem needs to go away. <laughs> like, I can't manage it on my own anymore. It needs to, you know, my dog can't be in pain. I can't handle this. Um, but actually, there's just, it's not realistic. Like, two hip replace, replacements would be 120,000 rand. Um, and then that's kind of the starting price. So, um, yeah, it's, it's again, kind of like, can I invest that money? That's not an investment, right? I can't, I can't invest that money into my dog. I can't look at it that way. Um, I, I need to invest that money for my child. So, um, so that's not an option. And then again, like the, the kind of next option would be femoral head and neck resections. Um, and I know that those can be done really successfully and you can have good outcomes. But in the back of my head, I'm kind of going the whole time. Well, if his movement now isn't OK for me, if now I'm seeing all these things that are worrying me, um, 
how am I going to feel when he doesn't have those joints? Like he might not be painful in his in his hips anymore, but he's going to have changed movement patterns, compensation. He's going to be shifting his weight forward. Like now, I'm just going to see even more red flags. Um, so that's a concern for me. Um, whether it's a hundred percent valid or not, I'm not sure because. Um, every case is different and every person that I speak to about the outcomes of femoral head and neck resections tells me something a bit different. So um, that's a bit of a difficult kind of decision to make, but yeah. So I, I do want to say like, if I look at my dog and where he is now, and if I look at a client's dog, when they say that their dog is really bad and painful, it's a completely different picture, right? I'm seeing things that they don't see. So um, so he's not that bad on the scale of bad. <laughs> it just feels really bad to me because I see all the little things. Um, and and yeah, he, I mean, he's my, he's my first dog, he's my baby. Um, it's, it hurts me to see him hurting. So that's what i'm worried about that with with, the, with that kind of option um yeah and and like like we know that conservative management is successful so i just needed to find more tools different tools tools that are going to work for my dog so that i can keep adding those in um and get him to be comfortable to have a good quality of life um, yeah, so that so that was my my brief dip into surgical management, um, and I do want to mention the the physical rehabilitation for the management of canine hip dysplasia by Dicus Levine and Marcelin Little. Um, they go into all the surgical procedures and their rehab in that um, research article, um, and we did a research refresh on that, which is in the members portal, where I focused on the the the. Um, surgical management because we already have so many resources for conservative management. Um, the resources in that paper are fantastic, but I didn't feel like, um, yeah, we didn't need to focus on that. We already have that in the portal um, and not so much about the surgical management. Um, so if someone were to do a, a total hip replacement, how would we work with that patient? Um, what would our goals be? What are our risk factors? Um, and how do we get our patient, you know, our patient through those um, possible complications if they do happen? Um, yeah, so that was kind of my focus with that research refresh which was really valuable for me in kind of making that decision as well. Mm. Yeah. So obviously now you've decided you're going conservative. Okay. Yeah. Um, so like let's chat about all the op options because like I think sometimes like if I think about when I was in practice, you start to do the things that you're used to doing and you think are working, but sometimes there are other things that you could be doing that might have a better effect or in some cases it depends on obviously the animal um, and so guys if you're listening if you guys are doing anything that we're not mentioning or even if the things that we are mentioning just give us your comments we want to know um, so this is all about sharing so yeah so let's chat about no worries let's chat about the let's chat about all the conservative ways in which you you can treat Sasha that you've looked at yeah um okay so I I think that, I mean, we all know that a, a multimodal approach is the winner. So we cannot just try and do one thing. Um, it needs to be a combination of, of many different things. Um, and that's, so the nutritional aspect is something where we've kind of fallen short. And the reason for that is that Sasha does not eat diet food. Every time I have tried to put him on a diet food, oh, a joint diet it sorry a joint diet he just stops eating like there's nothing that i can do to make that food appetizing he just stops eating um and over the long run it's very expensive right honestly joint diets are not cheap so um we've we've started and then we stop and the same thing happens with supplements he'll be on it for a few days if i'm lucky a few weeks and then he stops eating <laughs> So that's been really challenging. Um, I did have a consultation with a um, with a, with a holistic vet who who recommended bone broth um, as a as a as a joint supplement. Um, it's not the greatest, but at least it's some. It's more than nothing. Um, and he's eating that and he's loving that. Um, and we had a very very good um, 
webinar by Leilani Alvarez on choosing joint supplements, um, which I also found incredible, incredibly valuable. So it's called How to Choose Joint Supplements. And she goes into kind of the best ingredients um, that have been shown to be effective through research. So not chondroitin and glucosamine, glucosamine and chondroitin. Um, that shouldn't be our first choice. Um, but things like um, omegas, um, and then how to incorporate those into diets because your omegas are not so great to give as a standalone supplement. Um, and then a few other really interesting ones that that were new to me, like eggshell membrane. I didn't even know that was a thing, but apparently, yes. Um, so, yeah, there are, there are some really good options in there um, in terms of how we are going to look for supplements. Um, and then I think there are some good ways that we can incorporate those things into the diet outside of a supplement right as as like raw ingredients which might be more appetizing to super fussy dogs <laughs> mm -hmm. which, um which i don't know enough about so i don't really want to want to expand on that but i think that's that's something that we mustn't forget um and that's definitely somewhere where um where i fell a little bit short with sasha um and then like multimodal in terms of your home management um, and like what does the exercise routine look like and what can you do differently how can you change that um, and then of course weight management and I always forget that one because weight is not a problem with my dog but for many of our patients it is the primary problem they need to lose weight um, so really coming from as many angles as you possibly can um, and then once you've kind of covered all those bases um, what is going to what are what are your like what are your therapeutic what is your therapeutic approach going to be? Um, so I think obviously hydrotherapy is a no-brainer um, and it must, wherever possible, be a part of the plan um, in any way, shape and form that it can be, <laughs> is my personal opinion. Um, and then on top of that, um, Lisa Mason gave a fantastic lecture on the what, when, where, how, and why of our rehabilitation tools. Um, and that kind of gave me some new approaches to how I was already using my, my laser, for example, right? So mm -hmm. I know we all fall kind of into different classes Mm -hmm. when it comes to using laser therapy um, and I tend to err on the conservative or lower dosage side um, so kind of staying between two and ten joules per point would kind of be my my max out ten would be my max um, and there's some new research that's that's looking at arthritis where the dosages are way higher than that so I upped my dosage on my laser with Sasha and had a beautiful effect so within two treatments of like using 200 joules over his hip and back area per side he was moving better he had less pain he was looking great so that was very helpful um and sasha foster's um webinar on kinesio taping um gave me some different ideas on how to use taping so sasha's a long coat dog and i haven't been able to successfully use taping to help him in the past so I just shaved him. I just cut it all off. <laughs> and then I still couldn't get that tape to adhere. So <laughs> that failed um, until I cleaned it with alcohol. And then, not, like now it's sticking for up to a week. I have to pull it off. Um, and that helped a lot. So that was really valuable. Um, and the other one that I'm mulling over in my mind is ground treadmill exercises. So. I don't have access to hydrotherapy where I live now in the middle of nowhere, but I could have access to a ground treadmill. And um, Robbie Porter's webinars on how to use the ground treadmill and you know his fantastic exercises. Like if I'm looking at my dog's movement, he's got really bad abduction of his of his um, hind limbs. They, mm -hmm. they cross over. They're very unstable and if I use a ground treadmill, I can isolate 
that movement and help him to build the muscles to stabilize his hips um, into that um, abduction and strengthen the movements that he's really weak with. Um, and I like that idea because I can really be targeted with it and I can really be specific. Um, so yeah, we, I've been playing with some therapeutic exercises targeting those specific movements that he struggles with. Um, and we've had better results since I was I started doing that as well. Um, so yeah, those have kind of been my my new therapeutic modalities that I've incorporated into our um, into our routine. But I think that um, shockwave would also be really valuable. Um, mm -hmm. Again, that comes from Lisa's Lisa's webinar, um, and. Yeah, and then and then there are there there's kind of a next step beyond that, right? Where we start to look at, um, well, okay, that's what we can do as rehab therapists, but obviously w working within a rehabilitation team or a, um, a veterinary team, what else can can other members of the team bring um, bring to the table? Um, and so, speaking to a rehab vet, we're also looking at regenerative medicine um and what we can do where we are so like stem cells are not available everywhere um prp is more more widely available and kind of more affordable as well um so that can be an option but again depending on where you're like where the patient is in in the degeneration within the joint right so um so if it, to me that she doesn't think that PRP would be a great option for Sasha because the arthritis is already too advanced. And if there's no healthy cartilage, then the PRP doesn't have anything to work with. Um, so then you kind of don't have as great of an effect. Um, so you need to find even something else. <laughs> so I don't know if you want to jump in there, Meg. <laughs> well, well, didn't, um, I mean, so if I think like the things that I've used, which you haven't mentioned, is acupuncture. And I do that, mm -hmm. like I said, every single week. Um, mm -hmm. So acupuncture for pain management, you know, and, and when I look at these cases, I, I see two main things, okay? The one is managing pain. And the second mm -hmm. one, strengthening them to help to support that hip. So those are like my two goals with those cases. Yeah. Um, and being a vet, I'm actually, I'm able to do that, the, acu the acupuncture. Um, but another thing that I used to do um, was like it, it's basically um, injecting sort of they're not actually homeopathic they're called anti homotoxic medicines so I don't know if you guys are familiar with things like tormeal and um, so basically it's it's like a homeopathic medicine and they come in small little vials and what you do is you actually inject them into acupuncture points um, so tormeal is one that and and people that are work with horses will probably more know about tormeal. Um, because they, they use it a lot in, in the equine field. Um, even vets are using it there. And um, so when I say vets, vets that are just doing you know, normal GP type of equine vets. Um, but that I found was really, really, really useful, um, especially when I would do acupuncture and then I would inject into the acupuncture points the tromeal, and I'd find that the results of the acupuncture would last really, really long. And I, and I find, that, you know, with those kind of cases, if you can manage their pain, then you're able to do the strengthening. So that's yeah. the first thing is the pain. And, and that's one of the problems when we get to this end stage of hip dysplasia, these, these, these dogs are in pain. And so, so, you know, it's no point sending the owner home with a whole lot of therapeutic exercises if yeah. you're not managing the pain. And so that is like key. And before you put them into the, uh, into the treatment and all that, you've got to get that pain under control. And as soon as you do, and then you start the strengthening, you start to see, the, your your results start to improve and the outcomes start to improve. Um, but Sasha, it's so funny that there's just so many Sashas. So yeah. Sasha Foster is your dog Sasha, that other dog Sasha. Um, Sasha Foster did um, a series of lectures for us on therapeutic exercise. And um, she mentioned something about therapeutic, doing therapeutic exercises. And sometimes, you know, there's certain exercises where we actually might, might be doing more harm than good. Do you want to touch on that a little bit? Yeah, definitely. So, um, so it, Sasha Foster's uh, lecture where she was speaking about the hips is called um, hip instability. If you guys want to go check it out in the um, members portal, and something really interesting came up in that in that lecture. Um, so it does happen that um, 
that vets will not refer a young hip dysplasia patient to us because um, their perception of it is that the hip is not stable. So our modalities are not going to be effective in strengthening because if we're strengthening the unstable hip, we're just causing more of that luxation, subluxation. Um, so we're not we're not strengthening the hip in a in a in a great way, right? So Sasha Foster's approach to this is that um, yes, we cannot be doing um, you know we can't be doing active exercises with these dogs. We need to start with static exercises where we make sure that the hip is in a redu uh, in a reduced position, and by placing the dog properly um, by, by and checking the hip, we can make sure that it is in that correct position, and then do isometric exercises, as you know, um, static exercises where we're strengthening those stabilizers before we move into active exercises. And then she has recommendations for exercises that you should not be doing with these dogs because it's not going to be helpful um, and and where we should be starting. So I found that very valuable um, if we are looking at young dogs and also understanding that thinking pattern from our referring veterinarians and how we can discuss the specific challenge with them um, in terms of how we're going to overcome it and not worsen the problem. Um, and, and I mean, that's such an important point, right? The, the, the joint is unstable. And if the dog is going through a normal walk cycle, a normal range of motion of that hip, it's reducing and it's subluxating, which is not good for the joint. So we need to avoid that movement and we need to find a different way to facilitate the health of the joint as well as strengthen the stabilizing um, and then moving muscles of that um, pelvic limb. Yeah, I'm glad you brought up the the um, the acupuncture, Meg, because I actually want to say something on that, which which comes from my experience with Sash um, that I forgot. So, um, so yes, I'm a I'm a vet physio and not a vet, so I can't do acupuncture. So that hasn't been a you know a, a modality that I've reached for. Um, but I did go and see a vet that does acupuncture so that I could see if this is something that's going to help my dog. Um, and so I, I don't, I don't, you're going to have to give me a little bit of guidance here, Meg, but, um, from our, our webinars with Kenneth Ubar, where he focuses on pain and pain management, um, from a medical perspective, um, what stands out for me every time I watch those those lectures is the sensitization of the central nervous system when a dog when a, when we experience chronic pain our central nervous system becomes sensitized to pain and pain just like it just becomes worse and worse and worse so number one we should never allow ourselves to be in pain we need to deal with it as quickly as possible chronic pain is not okay we can't allow it to carry on um, in our patients and then secondly um, Sasha has been in chronic pain, right? So, um, and he's quite a, a wuss and he's very vocal <laughs> about it. So <laughs> when we went for our acupuncture, it was not an easy session and he definitely did not relax and lie down on the mat and go to sleep. He was not impressed with us even a little bit. Um, but I did see an effect afterwards and he was less painful. And she did give me some vials of trauma meal and showing me how to inject them into the skin, that I could try that at home and see how it works for him and what happens with him. Um, and so I did that and you're right, like there's a big difference when you use the trauma meal um, in those acupuncture points um, that she showed me, there was a longer lasting kind of pain relieving effect and it was beautiful, but Sash did not like it. <laughs> it was not a fun thing to do. <laughs> Yeah. So, yeah, it's so interesting you say that, you know, I mean, I've had dogs before that have been highly aggressive, like you can't get near them, right? And I'm um, always in those kind of cases, I'm always hesitant to to treat them because I feel sometimes if they're so tense and they're trying to bite you, they're trying to muzzle on and the owners are panicking, like well, how effective are my treatments ever going to be? So like with acupuncture, you can try and get a few needles in and then like step back. And then I put them on the pulse magnetic field mm -hmm. there back, um, and just hope, you know, hope something, uh, but you can't do any manual kind of stuff with them. And, you know, if I think about loads of cases, like especially those young dogs that have got hip dysplasia, mm -hmm. 
And here in South Africa, we have a, a breed called a boer bull, um, so which is like a cross between a bull mastiff and and what a bull bull is not something that that people overseas would know about. Um, no. So it's a South African breed, but it, it's like a bull mastiff, but a little bit smaller um, than yeah. that. And they are known for being quite aggressive, okay? But a lot of them have hip dysplasia. And I can think about one particular case where I, I really couldn't get near the dog. Like, I literally, I think I got one needle into the dog, yes. that's it. And um, over the time, the owners just persevered and they just said, no, like, we, we have to help him. And eventually, by the end of it, that dog would come and just lie down and I'd be able to put the needles in and the owner would be there. The muzzle was off like six weeks later and the dog loved me, you know, suddenly because it associated me obviously with the pain going away. And, but so what I'm saying is that your, you know, Sasha might've been a little bit nervous and a little bit averse, but eventually they actually start to realize. And if I look at my sunshine, you know, she comes now and she actually just uh, put the mat down and she knows it's happening. And she comes and she puts her back towards me and she puts her, her where she needs to be treated. Um, and, you know, she also, in the beginning, um, sunshine was so difficult. She would, I, I, I actually hated doing acupuncture on her because I couldn't keep her still. And now she yeah. just completely lies down. And one thing that, that, that you will find with acupuncture is that you actually need to have a series of acupunctures for it to to actually start to have effect so if they respond to one treatment then that's a really good sign and usually only after four weeks if you do it once a week for four weeks then you really start to see lasting effects and then you can actually do it on a monthly basis and most of them are actually fine um so yeah and i mean i, I think of another case it was a dog exactly the same and I used to rent a place that was right next to a veterinary practice. So I had my, my practice. And this particular dog, whenever any veterinary stuff had to happen, they had to come and call me for my practice to come and look in the dog's ear and do the eye and to put a catheter in. Whenever they had, they had to ask me to come because I was the only one that the dog um, you know, uh, trusted um, yeah. because of that. Exactly the same. When I went to the vet there, he had a muzzle on. And so... I think that I think that that they get used to it. That's what I'm saying. Is that it's initially it is because they're also associating whatever's happening with the vet and all the yeah. things that are happening in the vet. And you know, if, if you in your practice really try to minimize, and I think all of us vet we have is do this. Anything horrible happening, you know, our treatments yeah. should be calm and relaxing. And and that's why I always say like I never clip nails and I don't express anal bands. And um, so you know when you're a vet. A client will try and jump to that opportunity, and I don't do it because then they associate us with that as horrible things. Yeah, yeah. yeah Sashi is a bit like the opposite to our normal because he was a student dog, so we used to practice on him. Um, and he so now he associates anyone else who wants to do anything with him with being uncomfortable and being painful because they would obviously test his hips and poke and prod and he was not into it um, whereas mom can do anything and he'll just lie there he might complain but he'll behave himself um, and so he's like the opposite I, I, I haven't been able to get him to someone else to treat effectively because he just has this association with everyone else sucks and, and mom is allowed to touch me <laughs> which is okay <laughs> it's okay yeah so I, 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 well, the opposite with my dogs especially sushi she just sees really? me and she, you know, if i've got something in my hand that she thinks it's anything veterinary like she's mm -hmm. out the door so i mean chatting about the the pain control you know i think the one thing is is, is that you know we often get pet owners um, and especially the type of pet owners that come to us are, are often anti-medication right they're looking for something alternative yeah. um, and I think it's always a challenge for us to to be able to make sure that they are giving anti-inflammatory and painkillers yeah. if the dog needs you know for me my goal was always to get the dog off them so find alternative ways to manage this dog's pain so they don't have to be on the anti-inflammatory and painkillers long term but if they're needed, they are needed. Um, and if the owner is not giving them, it obviously affects our treatments um, and we're not able to do that strengthening in the long term, we don't get the results that we want. Um, so that's a challenge. Mm, and I, 
I think it's a, it's an important one to think about because um because yes, like I also I don't want Sash to be on on anti-inflammatories and opioids and 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 um but I also like pain is not okay and to me that has really been highlighted over the last while like i can't he can't even be in a low level of pain because of that sensitization that's happening all the time it's just not okay so i think um if we can if we can get our owners to to understand that that um that any amount of pain is going to prime your your nervous system for pain so that the next time that it experiences pain it'll be better at experiencing that pain which means it's worse so it's faster and it's worse immediately um, and the longer your dog is experiencing pain the faster and worse that pain signal is all, all the time so i think and i mean that's like it's a mind-blowing kind of thing to think about that our our nervous system is that plastic can adapt that quickly um but it does and we need to remember that so um yeah working closely with with your veterinarian in terms of making sure that the dog is on enough pain medication for where he is is important um yeah like i say at the moment sasha's on non-steroidals and opioids um and it's ordering on enough <laughs> i think we need to add something else in there yeah. as well um so yeah it's it's important and then obviously also we have all these people that are innovating and inventing things. Um, so I think we couldn't carry on talking about hypersphagia if we didn't talk about people that are making products. So there's that canine hippoline. And I think we must really get, um, I think it's Lisa, we'd really like to get her um, on a Facebook Live to chat about her product mm -hmm. and how that's helping dogs with hypersphagia. So there's so much, so much happening. Yeah, I think it's a very promising promising idea and I think that Lisa is doing some research on its effects um, so it'll be really nice to see those results in the coming yeah, years <laughs> all right guys thanks it's so much for joining us and a thank you for sharing your story and for all the learning that you found um, and yeah and for you've actually got an amazing blog that you that and wrote um, so I'm gonna ask um, Ellie from the online pet health team won't you share the link of that blog um, in the comments because um, it actually summarizes a lot of the stuff that we've been chatting about. So thanks for sharing, Anne. It's been great. Cheers, Anne. Have an awesome day. Cheers, Veggie Habits. See you guys soon. Bye. If you enjoyed this podcast, please hit the subscribe button so you get notified every time I load a new podcast. And please, if you get a moment, head over to Stitcher or iTunes and leave me a review. It's a really lonely job being a podcaster. And so the only time I get to hear from you or know that you're out there is when I get a review and know that I read every single one of your reviews. So to those of you that have left reviews, I want to say a very, very big thank you. Every time we get a review, it really helps to get the Vet Knee Rehabilitation Podcast out there to all the vet rehabbers all over the world. All right, vet rehabbers, so if you are looking for more continued education in the field of veterinary rehabilitation, head over to onlinepetout.com. Go be awesome, guys.